Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the NatSci Chronicles, the official podcast for the College of Natural Science at Michigan State University. My name is Jesse Early. I am the digital media manager for the college and the host for this podcast. The NatSci Chronicles is a podcast dedicated to keeping you up to date on all the latest happenings in the world of NatSci. In this episode, we'll be having a roundtable discussion about the So for Science program, a program started by a group of biochemists who are serving undergraduate students by teaching and sewing. How you ask? Stay tuned to find out. So welcome everyone to the podcast. Can I have you go around and introduce yourselves before we get started? Sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Amy Ralston, and I am a uh, James Billman Endowed Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And, Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my name is Claire Vieille. I am an Associate Professor in Microbiology and Molecular Genetics, and I also have an appointment in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Hello, I'm Kristen Parent. I am also a Billman Endowed Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And I'm Leslie Thompson. I'm an academic, uh, academic advisor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, so first and foremost, before we get into our discussion on the subject at hand, how are all of you handling the pandemic so far and are you ready for the upcoming fall semester? Um, I would say personally, I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. Um, I'm a mom and running a lab on campus and preparing for teaching um, and now doing a lot of other activities, which we'll talk about today. So my strategy is very much just one day at a time. Yep. Uh, for me, the upcoming fall semester looks different than usual uh, because I'm going to be starting a sabbatical. So I'm going to be trying to do as much research and remote learning from home as possible and doing my part by staying away from campus to allow the minimal um, operations to go to the students and the um, trainees who really need to be there. So I'm trying to help by staying away. So I think I'm doing okay with the pandemic. Uh, I'm a bit stressed, of course, like everybody else. Uh, so I'll be teaching in the fall, and I thought that the summer was going to be very long, and I accepted uh, a couple other responsibilities, and now I see the time passing by, and I'm getting really stressed because my course is nowhere ready, and uh, moving a course online is a lot of work. And I think I'm, I'm right there with Amy in the uh, day by day, sometimes moment by moment. Uh, I've been joking that the uh, size of the thread I'm hanging on to varies day to day um, and it's tensile strength along with it. Um, but I've been working, <laughs> um, I've been working with the students, the new freshmen with orientation all summer. It's just wrapping up this week and I've been really starting to think more and more as we transition into fall and that tra transition into the fall semester about how are we going to get these students ready for online learning and how are we going to make them feel connected to MSU in a virtual sense? So that's been on my mind a lot. Yeah. So for those of you teaching in the fall, I, I can't imagine the, how much stress you're under. So good luck to, to all of you. <laughs> time. So, so we're actually here today to talk about a project called So for Science. So can you describe what the So for Science project is to our audience and how it came about? Yeah. Um, so for science is a lot of fun. Um, basically, the four of us are making masks, um, fabric masks, and um, we're selling them as a fundraiser for our struggling undergraduates. So it started back uh, in March or so when I realized that fabric masks were going to be a really important way to fight the pandemic and that I have the expertise because my mom trained me how to sew and how to use fabric when I was a kid. And she also set me up with all this really nice equipment that normally just sits in a closet. Um, but I felt like if I could help, I should help. And I couldn't just not do my part. So I started making masks for colleagues, friends, family, just driving them around town and dropping them on porches anonymously, uh, just as gifts. Um, but 
then it got to the point where I started getting um, text messages from people I didn't know, like a, a friend of a friend's friend who had heard that these masks weren't great for kids and they wanted masks themselves. And so they were willing to pay for these masks. And I felt strange accepting people's money for myself because I already have a great job. Uh, but I realized that it could be this opportunity to serve our undergraduate students in a completely new way. Um, so I wanted to launch it as a fundraiser, but I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So that's when I con started to contact my colleagues, which are here, who are here today. So I'll, I'll have them chime in about um, what their experiences have been like joining So for Science. Yeah, so kind of initially for me, it was the, um, I knew that we had this need, we had done the, a survey with our students and found out that a lot of them were struggling. Um, and it, it was actually in a, a meeting where Amy was coming to talk about the masks she was making and um, giving and distributing, the, distributing them to some of the staff members. And we were also in that meeting discussing these, these students' needs and how a lot of them were left without um, jobs suddenly or their parents were without jobs and they had immediate bills to pay. And, and so we knew that was happening, but we, when we got the survey out, the results, we looked at it, we knew it was a much bigger scale. And so um, when Amy reached out and said, you know, I, I kind of opened my mouth in that meeting and said, I have a sewing machine, I could be helping. <laughs> and then when she reached out, it was orientation had started and I thought to myself, my heart said yes, my brain said no, you have enough, you have a family, you have a job, you have all this stuff going on. Um, but I did it anyways. And th through this, it's actually turned into a very therapeutic release for me. And um, I find that when I am stressed, it's better for me to walk away, go to a little sewing setup I have in my, in my dining room and just do 10 minutes and then, then come back. Literally, I'll walk from the computer, go do 10 minutes and come back. And it's just a, it's a positive, um, you know, low hanging fruit that you can do on your to-do list when everything else feels overwhelming. So I'm, I'm thankful for it in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, so I guess after this, it sort of snowballed and Amy, uh, really realized that she was going to scale this up on a, on a big, in a big way. And that two people alone probably weren't going to be able to shoulder all the responsibility. Um, unfortunately I did not have a sewing machine or any skills whatsoever that could be useful. Uh, so I started out just basically doing deliveries because I knew how to drive and I had a car and I thought I could help that way. But as the project developed and I saw so much enthusiasm from my colleagues, I started learning more and more. Um, scaled up to cutting and bending pipe cleaners and then uh, cutting fabric. And then more recently, I actually purchased a sewing machine to help out a little bit and I've been learning some of the basic stitches. So my goal is by the end of this project to be able to fully do a whole mask on my own. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm contributing by doing some of the the assembly line grunt work uh, and, and trying to help out wherever possible and learn as much as I can. So Amy contacted me because she wanted to give me a mask. And I told her, well, I'm already sewing masks. So we traded masks. So she saw my mask, I saw her mask. And then she asked me if I was interested in uh, joining in the effort and I, it turns out I was already quite concerned about the financial well-being of our students. I had done a survey about, uh, it was about the flat rate tuition um, earlier in the year. And um, so I was concerned about that. And so it was very easy to commit uh, to the project. And I have not regretted it. Okay. Um, in, addition, in addition to the four of us, um, I mean, this is really basically it. We have kind of an assembly line um, process, which I can show you a little bit at, uh, at the end, towards the end of this chat. Um, but we have been really lucky to get the support of a lot of different people. Um, we have some really amazing donors. Rose Brichta is our number one customer. Um, James Billman, who um, has an provided the endowments that support my lab and Kristen's lab, he has also been extremely generous donating over, uh, over and above our recommended um, donation rate. And then we have a lot of allies in NatSci who've been helping to promote our cause, um, especially Karen Wank and, um, and, 
and even um, our department chair, um, Dean Cheryl Sisk, and um, and uh, some of the graduate programs have bought a lot of students for either the students or staff in their programs. So that's been really key. Um, personally, I, I really benefit from having my mom on speed dial because she can solve any sewing problem I encounter. She knows about all, all the latest tools and the fanciest fabrics and, and the best supplies and where to get them. And, so I've really relied on her and her whole network. Her, her, uh, one of her close friends owns the fabric store that we rely on heavily for um, a lot of our prints. Um, so that's been really fun. And then of course, our families have tirelessly put up with our crazy, like invading the dining room, trail of sewing threads everywhere around the house. Where's mom? Oh, she's either Zooming or sewing, you know. So they've been, they've been really fundamental. I don't know if you guys want to add to that. I would well, say that um, uh, the comprehensive list of our donors can be found on our website. And so uh, as from today where we're talking to you to production, probably even more people will contribute. So to keep an updated list, um, we try to post it online to thank everybody for their efforts because it really is a, a grassroots bottom up kind of um, effort, and every, every little bit helps. Leslie, did you have something you wanted to? I was going to say, the, uh, I know um, early on, Amy was doing a lot of homeschool projects with the kids and the mask and do, masks and having, having them work. And um, my daughter has been helping trimming threads while she's watching Pokemon, et cetera. So I, uh, <laughs> it definitely does spread into all the things that we're doing in the day. And, and one of our colleagues in biochemistry also uh, purchased fabric for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the construction of the mask and how they differ from, say, a typical disposable, disposable mask that one might purchase from the store? Of course. Um, these are reusable. They're machine washable. Um, so there's, they have that going for them. They're not going to um, contribute to environmental contamination as some of the surgical masks have already started to litter the streets and parking lots. Um, in addition, these are pretty adaptable. They have a, a pocket for a filter of your choice. Um, we uh, try to um, keep up with the scientific literature to inform um, our mask design. This is an example. Anybody want to add anything I forgot? It has at least three layers plus the filter if you want to add the filter. And all the research has shown that two layers is the strict minimum to be very protect to be protective, and more than two is even better. So we our masks have at least three layers. The only thing I would add to is that since the start of the project, uh, we've evolved our design. So as we uh, get better and better and get feedback from our clients, um, we've uh, changed the way the straps sit on the back of your neck for more extended comfort use. And uh, we're always trying to make the best product we can offer with our means. And, and I'll add that, you know, um, having two small kids that, you know, don't want to have a tag in their t-shirt, let alone a mask on their face. Um, one of the things that I think is really different about some of our masks is, is the straps and the fact that these are t-shirt material. So they're soft, they have a little bit of stretch, not enough that they will stretch out while you're wearing them and start sagging and falling, but they have enough give that you don't feel like you are covered in it. And, um, and my daughter uh, actually gave me feedback this past week on that, hey, this isn't so bad to wear. I kind of like this. So um, I think... I think that is, is, is one thing that is, is very helpful. And they don't shift off their face either. So they're not messing with it. Once it's on, it's on. Another important feature is that they have a pipe cleaner. Kristen mentioned that she was instrumental in cutting all these lengths of pipe cleaner. So there's a pipe cleaner in the nose piece. So the mask will actually fit to, to the bridge of your nose and to your cheeks. And that really helps reduce glasses fogging. So, and Kristen's Which been dealing with pliers and bending the ends so they don't poke you too. So it's it's these little details that that only only four scientists with acute attention to detail would worry about. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was just going to say that I often have issues with uh, the mask fogging up my glasses when I'm wearing it. Well, Jesse, we'll give you one of ours and see what you think. Perfect. <laughs> I, yeah. I look forward to trying it out. <laughs> we great... have a Spartan Paisley to match your, your Spartan outfit. Ooh, nice. So you can nice. wear school pride. <laughs> Thank you. One great thing about them is also that we can we choose the fabric. So we can choose one that max matches our mood one day, and that also matches what we're wearing. So we have a lot of flexibility, so it's, it's a lot of fun. So that, that kind of brings me into my next question here. So you produce both uh, adult masks as well as masks for children. In terms of the look and the fabric you've chosen for the masks, I'm kind of curious how you settled on the designs for each. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, that's pretty fun. I mean, to, for the overall design, I reached out to my mom's um, network and uh, they recommended, and I, I followed their recommendations about what would be the best mask. And we're, you know, at, at the beginning, people were just wearing like underwear on their face. I mean, we really <laughs> did not know what was going to be a good mask. But being in touch with these professionals um, enabled me to come up with a design and we modified it a bit. I played with it a bit. But the goal is to make something that's an actual garment like not just some something you slap on your face, but something that's like the new necktie or the new favorite shoes so that really fits and, um, and is highly functional. So that's how we got came up with the structure. Um, for all the fun patterns, that part's the best. Initially, we just worked out of our stashes, like whatever fabric we had laying around, that's what, you know, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But now that we've started to generate some revenue, people are paying, um, and a very small portion of that, something like 15%, goes to fabric and supplies. The rest goes to undergraduates. So um, if one of you want to, wants to talk about our process for um, selecting and purchasing fabrics. Sure. Um, with modern day technology, even though we are physically distant while doing this, we can Zoom. And with online shopping, it makes it really easy for us to sit together once every couple of weeks, uh, track what patterns have sold the most, um, what colors, what styles are working, what aren't. And we, we look at new fabrics and try to come up with creative options for, for different people, uh, often over a glass of wine and having a lot of fun coming up with uh, names for the different designs as, as a group. It's been, it's been one of the fun creative parts of the process. So I saw on your website, which is so the number four science.com that you've donated over 500 masks and have raised over $6,000 so far. Uh, do you have a target goal that you're trying to hit? And if so, will the project end once you hit that goal or will you continue making masks as long as people are interest, interested in continuing to support the project? I think we keep going as long as our machines do. Um, it, I, I, I don't think we're going to stop as long as we can, continue to find the energy and our machines will keep functioning, then I think we keep going. Okay. Uh, Amy, as you mentioned, the, the funds you're raising for the mass sales are going towards helping undergraduate students at MS, MSU through the undergraduate relief funds. Can you talk a little bit about those relief funds and what they offer students who may be in need? Um, sure. Um, let's see. Leslie, did you want to take yeah. that? Sure, yeah. So we started kind of originally thinking about the B&B students because we had that survey right in front of us um, and we uh, were in tandem when we got that the results in that survey. Um, as a department, we started working on actually putting a fund together that went right to those students. Um, but as we've been going, we, we've, we've started gathering more and more funds. We're trying to reach a broader range of students. And what we're doing is we're looking for funds on campus that are, um, are not an endowed fund, but more of a, a fund that is made up specifically to give small amounts of money to students immediately. So reaching a broader amount and, um, and providing that immediate relief that they need right now for those bills, the groceries, things like that, that they're, that they're in need for. So we've, we've identified a few different funds so far that we've been able to donate to, and we're constantly kind of keeping our ear to the ground of what else is out there. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, our, uh, basically, I kind of feel like it's our job, like it is literally our job to serve 
students at Michigan State and especially and even the the larger public of Michigan because we're a land grant university that's what we're here for um, and if something crazy comes up every, once every hundred years so that your job changes a little bit then you have to go with it and so if this is how we can use our expertise and our skills to help our students now then then I think we're obligated to do that Oh. Yeah, and just oh. because we call ourselves so for science, it doesn't mean that we limit our donations to uh, like students in the STEM disciplines. Uh, we're looking at students from like underrepresented minorities, uh, students coming from migrant families, from the foster system. For um, so we're we're trying to reach out to. Uh, a lot of different groups of students so that they many of them can benefit from that and I think the students really appreciate the fact that we're doing this I've gotten feedback from a lot of them that besides being able to pay their bills or get the groceries or uh, whatever immediate thing they need um, knowing that the professors at the university are thinking about them and working hard to put their needs first gives them a, a feeling of a sense of community and um, support in a, in a way that goes just beyond the, the tangible. Okay. Uh, so as we wrap up this podcast, if someone in our audience wanted to help with the So for Science effort, what is the best way for them to do so and who should they contact? Spread the word. Um, the more masks we sell, the more undergrads we can help, and the more people we help protect against coronavirus. So uh, send, send our link to your family and friends and have them pick out what patterns they like. We've had a, a lot of people who order masks for their family and friends in different places. I think we've sent masks to over half of the um, states in this country. Um, and you know, especially to some of the hardest hit areas in Florida, Texas, now Ohio. Um, masks can be kind of culturally divisive, unfortunately. And I think it's because we've just never had to do this and people don't know how nice a mask can feel on your face if it's designed correctly. Um, so everybody doing their part to help us shift the culture towards one where we, we wear masks to take care of each other we wear masks to, to show each other that, that we respect each other. And I make my kids wear masks so that they understand that this is, this is our new cultural value also. Um, it's important to show your, your kids, even if, even if your kids aren't gonna be around um, anyone, it's nice if they, if they have a mask too. So in closing, is there anything else that you would like to share about the Silver Science Project that we haven't already talked about? Well, we thought it might be fun if we talked a little bit about how, how it is that you can collaborative, collaboratively make a mask together while sure. social distancing. <laughs> so we wanted to give you kind of a sense of, of the process. Um, so I have some props here. I've shown you a few already. But basically, the, the process of making this finished product can be broken down into several smaller steps. And that's what each of us um, does. And so... One of us will get the fabric, wash the fabric, um, and then prep it into squares. And then the next person will cut the pieces and put in the first seam and do some additional preparation along this edge. Um, and then there are additional pieces. There's you know six pieces per mask. So there are additional pieces that have additional hems done on them. And so we're constantly texting each other and driving deliveries over to each other's houses. We all live fairly close to each other, so it's, it's not a problem and it's kind of fun to get to wave to each other um, from a socially distant perspective and say, here's your delivery, I've got some things for you to cut, some things for you to sew. Um, Kristen bent all these pipe cleaners, as I said, and then Leslie cut all of these flannel filters. Leslie and Kristen have been, or sorry, Leslie and Claire have been sewing these pieces and now, uh, Kristen has has taken the bold leap to learn how to sew, even buying a, her own sewing machine. And then everything comes back to me and I put them together and I try to package them up. Um, these straps, we have lots of, these were cut by Claire. These are our new favorite plum straps. Um, and so then we put all the pieces together. 
and we try to be as organized as possible. We try to stay on top of the inventory, which is always shifting. Um, we have on our website right now, I think 25 different adult styles and about five different kid ones. And those are always rotating out because, and with the exception of the Spartan Paisley, which I think we will offer for a very long time, and our really favorite DNA print, which is also a, a big hit among the NatSci community, the rest of it turns over and once it's gone, it's gone. So we're trying to keep things always moving, um, always interesting for ourselves, but also for, for people who like to, like to collect masks. So that's basically our, our whole process in a nutshell. Um, it was a little challenging to work out. We had to have a lot of Zoom sessions to figure out how we were gonna do this safely, whether we needed to quarantine the, the items as they arrived from one person's house and before they went to the next and what level of biosafety we were comfortable with. Um, but so far, I mean, we've kept it going now for I think um, it's been almost, almost two months. And, and so far it's like, it's a nice rhythm. You're gearing up too for special events. We are looking forward to our Halloween collection. Uh, we think that we're not gonna be um, over this anytime soon and masks should be fun. So we're trying to plan ahead and keep up with change in seasons and offer ways for people to coordinate with their outfits. Very cool. Um, so anything else you guys would like to share with us? Um, how about our website? <laughs> sure. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Snowforscience.com. Yep, and that's number four. Yep, S number four. Number four, science. Yep. Um, and anybody who who wants to, you had asked um, initially, Jesse, if, if people wanted to get involved, how could they help? Um, they can always email any of us um, if, if anybody has new ways that they want to help or um, some creative ideas. We're totally open to that. Sounds good. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me on this episode and for letting our audience know all about the great work that you're doing with the So for Science program. So again, thank you for joining me. Thanks thank for having you. us. Yeah, you do. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Once again, I'd like to thank the So for Science crew for joining me on this episode. You can find more information on the Sew for Science program and pick up your own handmade mask by heading on over to sewforscience.com. That's sew, the number four, science.com. And that will wrap up the fourth episode of the NatSci Chronicles. If you'd like to support this podcast, please subscribe and rate us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Be sure to also visit us on the web at natsci.msu.edu slash podcast, where in addition to this podcast, you can also find our other podcast, the NatSci News Rewind. If you'd like to keep in touch with us on social, you can find us on Twitter at MSU underscore NatSci, on Facebook at MSU CNS, on Instagram at MSU NatSci, on YouTube at MSU Natural Science, and on LinkedIn, search for Michigan State University College of Natural Science. You can also stay up to date between podcast episodes and everything that's happening in NatSci by visiting our website at natsci.msu.edu. Thanks again for tuning in, and remember, making a difference, it's in our DNA.